You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Make social anxiety a thing of the past by using the powerful safe system for your social anxiety, freedom, and ease at quietbegins.com. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. Good to have you here. I was up till 4 a.m. last night working on the SAFE system, the social anxiety program. Uh, Not working on it, but finishing it up, making sure everything was clean and clear and polished and right. And so that is available at quietbegins.com. You heard me mention it at the beginning of the show, and I'll talk about it during the mid-roll ad. They call it a mid-roll ad, and uh, you'll hear more about it then. But for now, I'm going to talk about uh, a relationship challenge that someone is going through or at least they were a few months ago. I'm not sure if they're still going through it because this email is a few months old, but I'm going to go through it anyway, just in case they are or anyone else is dealing with this kind of situation. And it has to do with when your partner broke up with someone before you met, and now they are still in communication with that someone. And, you know, there's no kids involved, but they have a special emotional bond that can't be broken That is wonderful because they're such good friends. I know I'm a little sarcastic there, uh, probably because it would it would bother me if my girlfriend just broke up with some guy and then we met and I expected to get all the attention and we're growing something together. And she was on the phone every other night with her ex and they're sharing photos and they're talking about all kinds of stuff. I would feel a little left out. I would feel like, hey, aren't you supposed to be putting your emotional energy into us? Why are you still attached to this person? Now, I'm not saying that you can't be friends with your ex. That's not it at all. Uh, In fact, I'll get into this in a moment. I'm going to read you some portions of the email here and make comments as I go. Because it it is an important topic to talk about because there are people out there that are in relationships with not only the person they're with, but another person that has taken some of the attention out of their current relationship and putting it into their former relationship. And I think that's important to talk about because resentment can build. It doesn't build when, you know, everyone's okay with it. If you're okay with your partner uh, talking with their ex all the time or meeting up with them, then it's not a problem. You know, if there's trust involved and there's no issue, it's not a problem. It becomes a problem when it's a problem. It becomes a problem when the partner who is feeling left out, feeling like they're putting way too much time and energy, especially emotional energy, into the other person, and maybe there's a violation of values going on, uh, or maybe the relationship is new. Like, you can be in a new relationship, and your partner is talking to their ex all the time, And this new relationship needs to be nurtured, needs to be cultivated and supported and help to grow into something bigger and better. So it is absolutely secure and trusting and a full bond. You know, that feeling of an unbreakable bond, if that exists. (laughs) It's, it's, It's the feeling that this is unbreakable. I love what I have with my partner. Oh, you want to go talk to your ex? No problem. I love what we have. Of course you can do that. But when you don't have that, when you don't have that full trust and feeling of that unbreakable bond, then when your partner does something, you're going to feel something. You're going to feel left out. You're going to feel hurt. You're going to feel alone, alienated. 
And what do you do? What do you do from that point on? So I want to talk about that. I'm going to read you this, uh, at least portions of this email and see where we go with it. All right, I'm going to call this uh, person Liz. She says, something that I've been struggling with uh, is where do I go with my current partner? I really want to be happy and content, but I feel I'm not helping him in any way. It makes me feel heartbroken and worthless when he gets sleepless nights from stress that might be caused by me. Wow, okay, so <laughs> I, can, I can comment already. I haven't even gotten into the, the actual meat of this email. But if you are causing stress to your partner, then yes, we need to discuss that. Um, but if you are laying all the blame on yourself for this, then it almost sounds as if you're, in, um, you're on the opposite side of the finger all the time. What does that mean? It doesn't mean what you think it means, but it might. It might. Uh, the opposite side of someone pointing the finger at you all the time. And if that's the case, if you feel like you're always being blamed for relationship issues, go to Love and Abuse. Go to my podcast, Love and Abuse. It's on your in your favorite podcast player or loveandabuse.com. And you'll find information on, uh, there's an episode in there called Always Defending Yourself. and when Or When You're Always Defending Yourself. And that episode might be perfect for someone who always feels like they're getting the finger pointed at them. So if you're on the other side of the finger... Go to Love and Abuse, check out the podcast, and look up the uh, You're Always Defending Yourself episode. Because uh, if you're in this space, Liz, that's a problem. That's a problem that uh, it needs adjusting, it needs fixing. You can't be in a relationship where you're always defending yourself and you're always made responsible for everything because that's not equality. That's not two people working at something to make something great. That's one person saying, this is the way I want it, and you're the reason it's not this way. There's control in there. There's probably manipulation in there. I'm not saying it's conscious. I'm not saying he's doing it on purpose. I'm just saying it probably exists, and you might want to take a look at it. So check that out. All right, I'm going to move on here. Uh, a point of contention is his ex-girlfriend. They share a very close friend group together, so they talk almost every day. If it were just this, I think I could live with it. But for the first year and a half, he held off on changing his Facebook profile picture and status in fear that it would hurt her. This was after their breakup. Uh, It was also creating an online movie account for her to use, but not making one for me because she would feel uncomfortable. They'd share pictures, private conversations, phone calls, and other means to talk about things like her job, taxes, and gossip, and other mundane things. And I can already hear some people out there screaming at the podcast player. I know. (laughs) Uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, We'll get to it. Let me move on here. He didn't see any of this as a problem. He justified the first year of our relationship where he continued to live with her and have private uh, movie nights with her while we were dating. He said it was to save money, but my intuition says he had trouble letting go of her emotionally. We finally moved in together, and within the first month of living there, I found some old pictures of her that he was hiding. I've since made him privatize the old profile pictures of her and he accepted to remove her from the movie account once she was okay with it. But to this date, she still hasn't been removed. I know it's partly my fault for not putting my foot down sooner, but I always try to give the benefit of the doubt. All right, let me make a little side meta comment here. Uh, In other words, I mean, this is what you said. I always try to give the benefit of the doubt. Let me warn you about this. Anyone who always gives the benefit of the doubt, make sure that it doesn't include internal dialogue of, in other words, I let people violate my values just so they'll be happy while I suffer in emotional poverty. I know it's a kind of a dramatic way to put it, but I want you to make sure that you are not giving people the benefit of the doubt all the time by violating your own values just so they'll be happy. If you're not violating your values, great. It's okay to go, yeah, no problem. If you have a relationship there, I'm sure it's fine. But if you feel any type of value violation, and what do I mean by that? I mean that when you think about your relationship, what's most important to you about a relationship? What components are important? What components do you value? Because I can probably make an educated guess that at the top of your values, You don't have, I look forward to sharing my partner's time with his ex. 
I want to know that my partner has his ex in his life so that he is happier. Or a value of, I want a partner that isn't phased that I'm bothered that he spends a lot of time with his ex. I'm making this stuff up, but I guarantee you those are probably not the top of your values list in relationships. What's at the top might be, I want to spend as much quality time with my partner. I want my partner to put his time and energy into me. Of course I want my partner to have friends, but maybe not so close with his ex. Who knows? I mean, whatever your values are in a relationship, I want you to assess those values, and if they are being violated, I mean, you might have to write these values down and figure out which one's being violated here. If they're being violated, then don't use the excuse of I try to give the benefit of the doubt. Because once you violate your own values by giving someone the benefit of the doubt, especially if that's a pattern in your life, because I've found that the more people that give the benefit of the doubt more often are usually the ones that get stepped on and walked all over more often than not. Because they give the wrong people the benefit of the doubt because those people don't have your best interest in mind. They do more selfish things. So you have to be very, very careful who you give the benefit of the doubt to. And in fact, you may even want to remove that from your vocabulary. Uh, This might be bad advice, but... You may not want to give the benefit of the doubt more often than not. Why not see things a little skeptically? I carry around with me a skeptical optimism all the time, or optimistically skeptical. I like to question things. I don't just blindly go, well, I'm sure everything's okay, so I won't think anything more of it. I think that's a bit of denial. I think you put yourself in a bad place. When you put yourself in denial because you think it's a better place to be that person that always gives someone the benefit of the doubt, I think you just have to be very careful because that can work against you. In fact, where did you learn this? Where did you learn that it was okay to give people the benefit of the doubt? I understand the sentiment behind it, and absolutely, we should hope the best from people. But when you look at your past and you figure out, every time I give the benefit of the doubt, something goes wrong, or many times when I do that, something goes wrong, or I'm burned, then maybe that's the wrong approach. If it's working for you, then, you know, don't take that away, of course. But if you find that you're doing it as a way so you don't have to face your own problems, so you go into denial of of what's really happening, so that you can paint a better picture of your life than what is, then you really have to stop doing that to yourself. You have to stop going into that benefit of the doubt mode. There's so much more to unpack here. Let's go over it right after this. Here's a few words on the uh, safe system for social anxiety if you're interested in that. Be right back. Today, a massive project has been completed. This is a product that was sent out into the world with the potential to minimize or eliminate social anxiety sufferers everywhere. Uh, The product is called the Safe Empowerment System for Social Anxiety. It is something I took on back in October, uh, November maybe of 2018, and I started creating what I believe to be the most unique and really probably the most powerful audio program for social anxiety available. I knew this was a massive undertaking when I took it on and I decided to not just handle it all by myself. So I reached out to a bunch of experts in the field of anxiety, especially social anxiety, and I asked them to contribute as well. The SAFE system is an audio program crafted in a way to dive into your subconscious mind and plant seeds of healing and shifts in your perception while keeping your conscious mind busy with real world processes so that both your conscious and unconscious mind are tackling this anxiety thing together. In other words, it's not just advice. It's a combination of high-level techniques, subliminal repatterning, meditative confidence building, and long-term positive hypnotic conditioning. (laughs) I know it sounds almost like brainwashing, but it's not. It's nothing like that, Uh, at least not in the negative sense. It's more like um, brain rewiring. Because your brain has known the anxiety pattern for so long. I mean, if you suffer with anxiety of any sort, 
the brain gets used to doing it and it becomes a rut. It becomes something that plays over and over again like a record. And like the needle in the groove of a record, it doesn't know how to get out. It doesn't know how to play a different groove. It just follows the same groove until the end of the record and then starts all over again. And I know I've lost some people because they don't know what LPs are. <laughs> but uh, maybe they do. I mean, it certainly used to be popular culture, but now everything's a digital download. But anyway, <laughs> I want to help you skip to a new groove. I want to get you on a different, more upbeat record. Anxiety and social anxiety aren't supposed to run your life. You're supposed to have a choice on whether you want to be anxious or not. I know, a choice? What? Yes, I believe you should have a choice on how you want to feel. It's not easy, and sometimes it feels like an impossible task, but that's why I created this system, to give you different choices in how to feel when it comes to anxiety. This program is all about social anxiety, but anyone with general anxiety would definitely benefit as many of the learnings are designed to reach you at that deeper, unconscious level. The safe empowerment system can be found at quietbegins.com, and it comes with eight 20 to 40 minute learning audio pods filled with both conscious and unconscious elements, and 10 emergency audio pods, which are about four to six minutes long, and are meant to be played when you start feeling anxiety coming on. They're all MP3s. They can be downloaded to any device, phone, tablet, computer, and then played when you need them, especially when you need them, because that's when you need guidance most. The emergency pods will walk you through your anxiety moments, so take them with you everywhere you go. There'll be 10 more emergency pods released this year, so when you purchase the safe empowerment system, you'll get the extra emergency pods for free as they're released. Plus, there's more coming to the safe system as I get feedback from those who have purchased it. And you can purchase it today and download everything you need to get started overcoming your anxiety now at quietbegins.com. You haven't seen anything like this. I want you to benefit from my experience and the combined experience of eight other professionals who have not only experienced severe anxiety in their lives, but have also gotten out of it and want to teach you how to do so as well. Quietbegins.com. Start your journey out of social anxiety today. Welcome back. We're going to go right into the next section of Liz's email. And uh, we just talked about her giving people the benefit of the doubt. And I had some comments on that. And uh, the next part of her email gets into something a little bit different. Let's see. She says, I think he feels guilty that it was the first time he'd ever cheated. And it was on her to be with me. I want to be happy, but it's so hard to stay positive when I keep seeing her picture or her name in various spots to remind me of how much love and respect they share for one another still. Okay, so let's address the cheating. If he cheated on her to be with you, that was his choice to do so. And he may certainly feel guilty, but having an emotional affair with her now makes this situation ten times worse. So the question is, why doesn't he feel guilty being with her when you are now feeling left out? Yes, I would call this an emotional affair when there's an intimate sharing with someone that you were once or are still attached to in some way, and it feels like a violation to the relationship, you know, the violation of those relationship values, I would call that an emotional affair. So he cheated on her to be with you, but here he is emotionally cheating to be with her. Now I'm really backing him into a corner. I'm really labeling him him here, and I don't mean to. Uh, Don't even take that at face value. I'm just putting some feelers out there that may be resonating with you, with the thoughts you're already having, but maybe uh, aren't willing to conjure up inside yourself and say, oh, this really is an emotional affair. The way you explained it in your letter, I would look at as an emotional affair. And we're going to talk about uh, what is the difference between the emotional affair and the friendship with the ex, And because I do believe it's okay to have a friendship with an ex, But, you know, there's certain elements, certain criteria that need to exist. And the criteria is not being met here. And we'll go over that in a minute. But, uh, yeah, if he feels guilty cheating on her, then that's my question. Why doesn't he feel guilty 
having an emotional affair with her and you're left feeling bad and left out and isolated and alone and feeling like the relationship couldn't be all it could be. Because I tell you what, if my girlfriend said, you know, when you hang out with Jill across the street and you were dating her before we met, I mean, I'm making this up, but because you were dating her before we met, and right after you broke up, you're going over there a week later and you're watching TV together and you're laughing it up. I'm a little uncomfortable about that. If my girlfriend said I'm a little uncomfortable about that and I wanted my relationship, this current relationship to grow and prosper, I would nurture the heck out of it. I would say, oh, I, I didn't know that made you feel uncomfortable. I'm not going to go over there anymore or I'm going to limit my limit my access because you're right, I do spend a lot of time over there, but I didn't know that made you feel uncomfortable. And I would rather have you feel loved, supported, comfortable, and trusting, and feeling like we have something special, and that we share something very personal between us. I don't want you to think I'm sharing what I share with you with someone else. I don't want that to happen, especially the ex that I just broke up with, and now you and I are together. Why would I want to take anything from this relationship? Because I plan on having this relationship forever. And that relationship, yes, it can be a friendship, but maybe I didn't realize how much it affected you. Now, it would be different if I walked across the street to Jill's house and I was fixing her lawnmower. <laughs> or every now and then she needed a favor and I took care of it. And it was no big deal. But the intimate quality time makes it a little bit more emotional. It makes it a little bit more like, hey, what are you doing over there when you should be over here spending quality time with me? And even if my girlfriend wasn't home half the time, then would she also feel that it was a violation of the relationship or a violation of her values if I went and spent quality time with Jill? I don't know. It would have to be a discussion, but it would have to be an open discussion where I was open to the idea that it was bothering my current girlfriend. The last thing I want to do is make my current girlfriend unhappy. And this is one of my points to you, Liz, is that the last thing he should be doing is making you unhappy. I mean, you're the one that he has chosen to spend his time with. You're the one that he is with today. You're the one, if, I mean, I can only assume that you're the one that he wants to be with continually. Unless that's not true. Unless he doesn't feel that way. Unless he doesn't feel the same way you do. Is he just, you know, I hate to introduce this concept. Is he counting the days? Is he just waiting for you to leave? Is he making you so upset that you'll just go away? I hope not. I hope that he just doesn't realize the impact that he's having on the relationship and how it's affecting you and how important it is to have this discussion in an open, receptive way, where instead of going, well, she's my friend, and you should just get used to it, I hope it doesn't go that way, but if it does, then there's definitely a problem. So we'll, we'll get into some of this in a moment, but let me go on here. You go on to say, I've started developing thoughts of guilt because he's had to turn down invitations to hang out with them, uh, his ex and their mutual friends, and uh, I can't seem to get over this. He wants her and I to be friends, too. He's invited me to their outings, but I know I'd feel so degraded and out of place. So let me go back to a little sarcasm. So he wants to get you to know his emotional mistress better so that you two will get along and relieve him of having to choose between the two of you. Again, I'm being a little sarcastic. I'm giving him a little hard time. I don't know if he's listening to this, but it's important that it goes in your head this way or his head this way. It's important that it, it sinks in this way. Because if you are basing this on, you feel like he is spending a little too much quality time taking away from you, not necessarily quality time away from you, but that feeling of trust, that feeling that your relationship is secure. He's taking away these feelings. I don't, not that he has necessarily the power to do so, but it's happening. What is happening is causing you to feel less secure in your relationship. And if that's happening, then when he says, oh, I want you to get to know her better. 
that feels like a slap in the face. I mean, if I'm going to put this to the extreme level, let's just say that he was physically cheating on you. Let's just say that he had a real mistress out there and you found out about it. And he said, look, if you only got to know her, maybe you'd get along great. You'd probably not welcome that into your relationship. You'd probably have some thoughts and feelings about it. And the only reason I mention that is because I'm thinking that there's a part of you that really believes this is an emotional affair. And if you have that base level belief that this is an emotional affair, then a comment like, you should get to know her, is going to be very offensive. It's going to be a huge slap in the face, like I said. I have no other way to kick in the crotch. It's going to be very offensive. And how dare he do that? He may not know that you believe it's an emotional affair, though. He may not think that. So I don't mean to throw him under the bus with everything I say, but you communicating this is very important. Your baseline belief, if you see it as emotional affair, this needs to be communicated in some way. I mean, personally, if this came up in my life and my girlfriend was chatting with her ex all the time and it seemed very intimate and bonding, I would pinpoint the behaviors that really bothered me. Like, wow, When you talk to him, you seem to smile more often and laugh more often than you ever do with me. That feels weird to me. When you talk about him, you glow. When you talk to me, you look bored. You know, if that were happening, I would probably bring up and focus on the behaviors that really bothered me. That way you actually have something to talk about. That way you can actually say, I feel this way when you do this. You know, psychotherapy 101. I feel this when you do that. You're not necessarily blaming them for the way you feel. You're just pinpointing the stimulus that causes you to feel that way. When you wink at her in public, I feel slighted. I feel like I am inferior to her. I feel like I'm not as important. And that by winking at me in public, it means nothing more than winking at her and it's nothing special. So it doesn't feel romantic to me. Because you wink at her too. You know, communication like that is very helpful to focus on the specific behaviors that are causing you to feel bad in some way. That's a good line of thinking when you want to bring this stuff up. So what else I want to say? Um, When someone leaves a relationship, no matter what the reason, and they get into another relationship, I believe there has to be a hiatus of some sort uh, because the emotional tether may not be disconnected. And when you have an emotional, for lack of a better term, tether to someone else, there's an energetic type connection. There's a, um, you're still thinking of them. They're still in your mind. They're still influencing you in some way because you still have feelings. Like you said, maybe he has guilt for cheating on her and he's trying to make it up all this time. And he really does get along with her well, and they really are good friends, but the emotional tether is still tied to the past. It's not a new friendship. It's an old relationship that transformed into this whatever it is. And that concerns me. When someone breaks up and there's no hiatus, there's no break from each other, they haven't explored their own lives by themselves without each of them influencing each other, then they haven't grown to a point where they know themselves and they haven't redefined the relationship they have. They just transformed it into something else. I'm not saying that can't work, but in your case, Liz, I believe that the old feelings, those that old emotional connection hasn't had time to wane. It hasn't had time to release and let go so that they can start fresh and they have a clear understanding of what they need to focus on next in their life. Because I tell you what, if the tether was completely severed, and there was no emotional energy in between them, then you could meet her and be friends. And she would probably want to meet you and be friends. But that emotional tether is still there. They haven't had a long enough break from each other for it to be cut. And so they haven't lived long enough as separate people in order to figure themselves out and break that tie and then start fresh later. I fully believe that as soon as you can break the energy between you and meet anew without history, as Eckhart Tolle says, when you can meet your ex without history, you can start fresh. You can start a new relationship. 
It can be a friendship. But if that break isn't there, and you still feel the need to do the same things you did while in a relationship, then go right back to that emotional affair. That relationship hasn't ended, unfortunately. It's a dangerous game. If the emotional tether is not disconnected, it'll cause the new relationship that both of them are in. She doesn't even sound like she's in a relationship, but it'll cause the, the new relationship to suffer. While the old one continues to be nurtured, that's the danger, is that he's still nurturing this old relationship while allowing his new one to suffer. Like I said, it alienates you, and he's continuing to string along his old partner. I would call that a relationship conflict of interest. There needs to be time apart from the ex so that the emotional or energetic tether can be severed and both can learn to live life without the other person for a while. It'll help both of them grow into the people they are without their old partner. Because there is a difference between who you are without someone and who you are with someone. When you meet someone and you share experiences with them and you develop an intimacy, it's not just you anymore, it's us. And even with him and his ex, there's too much of us there. Her and him. There's too much of us there. So there needs to be that separation so that I and I can meet. Me and me, you know, however, however you want to look at it. There needs to be two individuals that have filled in all the gaps of the missing us in other ways instead of seeking each other to fill those gaps. Like I said, dangerous game. I'm not saying it can't work. It's just it's not fun for the other partner to deal with because basically you're dating him and his ex. They're a team. And I would ask him if he feels guilty spending time with her and giving her special attention knowing that it hurts you. Because if he doesn't feel guilty for hurting you and only holds on to the guilt of cheating on her, then you know where his priorities lie. That would be a very good conversation to have. But I will say this, uh, don't tell him to end his relationship with her. It's for you to decide what you want for yourself. And I think you say that at the end of this email, and I'll read it in a second. But uh, if you decide that you don't want to date him and his ex, you can make the choice to leave if you want. If he doesn't want to lose you and wants to do anything he can to keep you, he may decide to break it off with his ex and cut ties completely or at least decrease their connection as much as possible. And maybe that would be good. Maybe that would be great for both of you. Maybe he'll realize that it's a bigger loss to lose you and it'll set his priorities straight and he'll realize, wow, nurturing this other relationship is really hurting the one I'm in, and I can't lose that. I'm going to put all my focus and energy in this because this is the person I go to bed with at night. I assume you sleep together. And uh, this is the person I want to be with forever. I'm going to assume you want to be with forever, at least as long as possible. And uh, this is the person I want to spend all my time with. So I'm not going to risk losing that. It is weird to see people risk losing their current relationship by simply telling their partner, well, you should just get over it. That's how I am, and that's how this is. You should just get over it. It's amazing to me that people get into that state, well, you're just going to have to get over it, instead of talking about it. I mean, yes, there are times when those words might be valid. Well, I like to listen to country music in my car. Well, I hate country music. I never want to hear it. He might say, well, you don't have to listen to it while you're in my car. I can play it as loud as I want. Well, I don't want you to (laughs) listen. Well, you're just going to have to get over it then. Because that's what I like. That's who I am. That might be a valid reason to bring that up. You know, you should just get over it. But for this, no, this is not a good time to say you should just get over it. This definitely needs to be discussed a bit deeper because he has to know he's risking happiness, your happiness. If you're not happy, the relationship is not healthy. If the relationship is healthy and you're happy, then things go well and you feel that trust and you feel that bond. Then, then this side relationship with someone who used to be his partner could develop in a different way. But I just mentioned what is needed and in the separation and all that too. So, But my point is you have to decide what you want for yourself. You have to look at this as if it would never change, what would I do? Because yes, you are pretty much dating him and his ex, at least the, the relationship they have now. If he doesn't want to lose you and he wants to do anything he can to keep you, And then he decides to break it off with her, cut ties completely, or at least, like I said, decrease the connection. And that would be great. But um, he has to do it from a place of empowered decision. 
In other words, he has to take full responsibility for this decision and never, ever hold it against you that he broke it off with her. Because as soon as he makes it about you, then you'll realize he's holding resentment against you and never wanted to break it off with his ex and only did so to keep you. That's not what you want. You want him to want you. You want him to want you to be happy. You want him to want your relationship to prosper. You want him to want to spend quality time with you. You want him to not want to share intimate bonding moments with his ex. They had their chance and now it's yours. Now it's your turn. You and him have this opportunity to build something great and it's disintegrating in front of your eyes. So you do have to make the choice if you want this relationship with him and his ex because that's what it does seem to be. It's not just him. It includes her. It's like someone that owns a uh, spider monkey in their house (laughs) and they don't cage it and it roams freely throughout the house. If you date that person, the spider monkey comes with it. (laughs) So you can't complain. I mean, you could look at it this way. You can't complain when this other person says, well, I do have a spider monkey. Well, but I love you so much and I want to be with you and you're such a nice person. Okay, but I do have a spider monkey. (laughs) Okay. Then you go over his house or her house and now this monkey is flinging stuff and throwing stuff and making noise and that person's okay with it. But now you're thinking, oh, this is the whole package. E. So this is something you need to look at with yourself in your relationship, Liz. Is that, is this going to be the whole package from this point on? Because if it is, then you need to focus on yourself and what you need to do for you. I'm going to read the rest of your email. I don't think I have, to, I might have some more comments here. Every time I see her profile or her name or picture pop up on his phone or chat, I get extremely uncomfortable and annoyed and I can't help but show it uh, whether by making a face or storming off. He responds by asking if I'm mad. If I tell him the truth that I'm mad that their relationship makes me very uncomfortable, he tells me to get over it because they're just friends. All right, there's that get over it. I think I must have read that earlier and thought about that get over it comment. So I've already kind of mentioned that. We've had numerous discussions about this, and it just seems to make things worse. Oh, I bet. Uh, I've made so many concessions, like letting them to continue to talk, quitting my job, moving to a new city far away from my family and friends. I know the past is the past, but I can't help but feel weighted by it. Well, that's because it hasn't stopped. What you are hurt by is continuing today, not the past. This isn't even about the past anymore. It's about how he is today with this person. I mean, it's sort of about the past because they were intimate and they had a relationship and they didn't take that break from each other and meet as friends later. But if you looked at the behavior today, I guarantee you there's many things that you feel are being taken away from you and your relationship with him because he spends time with her. Especially what you said earlier. He wasn't willing to hurt her by, I don't know, removing an online profile or a movie profile or something like that. And he didn't want his ex to be hurt by your presence, by her seeing your online profile or something like that. That is very telling. That is telling you that he is more concerned about her feelings than yours. Not trying to convince you to do anything here. I'm just saying these are the data points that you need to know so that when you go into a conversation with him, You bring this up. Are you more concerned about her feelings than mine? Because if that's true, then what do we have here? Because this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but she's so sensitive and I feel so bad. So you'd rather nurture that relationship over there knowing that it is hurting our relationship? Where are your priorities, man? All right, just about done here. The worst part is every time I try to explain why I feel so hurt by the past, I bring up examples. He'll deny it and say I remembered it differently. I don't have a lot of proof for the in-person conversations that we've had, but I have a pretty good memory. It's making me feel crazy when the response he gives me to the facts is literally just, no, that's wrong. I feel very alone in this relationship when he shuts me down like that, but the weight of my disappointment is hard on him too when he just wants to keep both me and his ex close. All right, this is like the second or third time that you felt bad for him. I get it. You're, You're a compassionate person, but I think he's trying to make you feel bad for doing something that is hurting you and the relationship. 
And that is emotional abuse. Go back to Love and Abuse podcast and start listening to that. It's going to be important in, in this matter. An extreme example of what you just said, and I'm going to go back to the cheating analogy. Uh, someone cheats on their partner. Their partner finds out. And then the cheating person says, if you treated me better, I wouldn't have cheated. That is such a manipulation, that is such a manipulative guilt trip that you can pull on someone. If you didn't do this, I wouldn't have made the conscious choice to cheat on you and betray you. Even though our relationship contract says, I'll never cheat on you or betray you. But because you acted in this way, which you probably didn't, he's just making it up anyway, it gave me permission to cheat. Therefore, I get permission to cheat on you because you acted in a certain way. And the punishment doesn't fit the crime, but therefore it's your fault that I made the conscious choice to cheat on you. They don't say I made the conscious choice. They just use this type of manipulative wording to make you feel bad. So the reason I said this, Liz, is I don't want you to continue blaming yourself if he is blaming you for his behavior that you find offensive. That is a twisted manipulation and... You need to stop feeling so sorry that he can't keep his ex and you close. It's just, you know, if he's trying to do everything right, that's a different story. Then, sure, feel guilty. (laughs) Feel guilty if you want. But if he's continuing to do things that he knows is hurtful to you, that he knows is disintegrating the relationship, then I find it hard to feel sorry for someone who's not even trying. And just says, get over it. That to me is like going to court and say, get over it. I robbed a bank. If the cops weren't so busy at donut shops, they would have known that I was robbing the bank. So as far as I'm concerned, I earned the right to rob this bank. It's just stupid logic. <laughs> it's, it's not even fuzzy. It's stupid logic. It's logic that helps me get away with bad behavior. Remember that. Don't fall for logic that helps somebody get away with bad behavior. All right, last couple lines here. I feel absolutely guilty every time he rejects invitation after invitation to hang out with her and their mutual friends because he tells them, my girlfriend doesn't want to go, so I can't go. This is the truth, but it sounds like he throws me under the bus every time he tells her my girlfriend is uncomfortable with that. I have met all of his close friends except her on more than one occasion, and they really are great people. I don't have a reason to dislike her, but I just can't stand to be in the same physical room as her, so we have to cancel a lot of plans. She's also bailed on plans on occasions that she knows I'll be there too. My question is, is there something I'm overlooking or am I really just that pathetic and have stayed for too long? Is there an underlying aspect within me that I need to control to make this work for both of us or is it time to call it quits? Okay, Liz, I just read the majority of your email and um, commented on the majority of it. I hope my comments were helpful. Oh, my last comment is when somebody you really care about uses you as a scapegoat, and this is a really good point, actually, they're not invested in you. They're not invested into your relationship. They're invested in themselves, and they don't want to take responsibility for their own decisions. In other words, when you decide to be with someone and that someone doesn't want to do something, and then you tell your friends or other people that, oh, he or she doesn't want to go, so I guess I have to stay home. That is so passive-aggressive. That is just so mean to do to the person that you're choosing to be with. It's like telling people, I made a huge mistake choosing this person, but since I don't want to make the changes that I need to make for me, I'm just going to make them feel bad over and over again. That's what this feels like to me. It feels like he's not taking responsibility in his own decision to be with you. And what I mean by that is he chose you. He wants to have a relationship with you. If you're uncomfortable with something, he should support that. He should support you being uncomfortable with it and not make you feel bad or guilty by telling other people that, oh, she doesn't want to go. I mean, that absolves him of his choice to be with you. I mean, indirectly, but directly. Because when you're with someone... You love them, you back them up, you support them, you support their choices, you support their path. And if you say, you know, I don't want to go because she'll be there, then he should be telling his friends, yeah, we can't make it. That's it. But when he goes the extra mile and says, well, my girlfriend doesn't want to go. He's afraid to take responsibility for his own choice to be with you. 
it's hard to explain, but I think you get it. If you're with someone who has choices and you want to stay with them, then there's a certain level of accepting some of those choices and not holding those choices against them. You want to be able to support your partner's path to happiness and path to comfort and ease. And you want to be able to do these things for them so that they feel that you're on their side. I mean, do you feel that he's on your side? I mean, I know you don't. You, you said he feels like he's throwing me under the bus. Yes, I agree. And I would even say, don't use me as an excuse. Yes, I don't want to go. That's true. But why can't you say no for both of us? Why do you have to specifically name me as the person that doesn't want to go? Is it because you don't want to look bad in front of your friends? Is it because you're embarrassed by me in some way? Hey, you're not going to agree on everything. It's true. But when you start using the closest people in your life as scapegoats, as the excuse you need to get out of confrontation, then what you're doing is only disintegrating the closest relationships in your life and why bother having a relationship if you're just going to disintegrate it like that? Why? What's the point? It certainly doesn't make her feel warm and comforted and loved. It makes her feel like a tool. I'm sure, Liz, you, you feel used like a tool. Probably not the best way to put it, but <laughs> I think you get what I mean. Anyway, Liz, thank you so much for this email. We'll be right back and uh, close the show after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you to go to quietbegins.com for the safe system on social anxiety. You're going to dig it. If you have any issues with anxiety or social anxiety especially, check it out. i got a description there and uh, maybe it's the perfect thing for you. I also want to remind you of loveandabuse.com, the love and abuse podcast and the mean workbook on emotionally abusive and manipulative relationships. I get a lot of good feedback on that workbook on helping people identify exactly what's going on in their relationship and uh, why it's so complex, why it's so difficult, and why they feel bad all the time. This workbook helps you discover why that is. Over at loveandabuse.com. I want to thank patron members for supporting the show over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. If you find value in this show, head over to the patron site and you can become a sustaining member and get free workbooks and a bunch of private episodes that no one outside the patron program has ever heard. Stuff I talk about that I don't necessarily either have time to talk about on this show or can't do it because of certain subject matter. Uh, I get into some deeper stuff over there, so it's pretty interesting sometimes. Um, but if you're interested in supporting the show, we absolutely welcome that over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And thank you to those also using the donate button and the Amazon button at theoverwhelmedbrain.com as well. And speaking of support, why don't we support our loved ones? I mean, some of us don't support our loved ones better than strangers and friends. This email that I read today is a good example of that. Why wouldn't you want your loved one, the closest person in your life, the one that you're going to see more than anyone else in your life because you come home to them, because you see them day to day or every other day if you're not living together or whatever? Why wouldn't you want to treat them so nice and so wonderful that they can't wait to see you again and they would do anything for you? It's confusing and I say it's confusing even though I've done this myself. I mean, when I was in my teens and 20s and 30s, I was not supportive. I mean, I was. I was supportive in many ways, but I wouldn't have a problem making my loved one feel bad. Mainly my romantic partners. I would not have a problem making them feel bad. And um, I've talked about on the show before, being emotionally abusive, making them feel guilty, making them feel less than worthy, making them feel wrong making them feel responsible for all the problems in the relationship. I did a lot of that crap, unfortunately. Uh, and it took uh, many, many decades. It took a long time to understand that, oh, I could have a better relationship if I tried to make my partner happy. Not in a people-pleasing way, but supported my partner, supported their path to happiness, supported their decisions 
supported them when they were offended or injured or hurt by something that I said or did and realized, wow, I don't want to hurt my partner. Why would I want to do that? I only realize that now, my late 40s. <laughs> it took a while, but I'm telling you, just in case you're in a situation where you're throwing your partner under the bus, like Liz said in her email today, uh, because it's just easier to do that and make them feel bad and maybe they'll learn and maybe they won't and who cares? You know, there's a flippant attitude. It's a very apathetic approach to a relationship and it's very harmful. That is the incremental disintegration of what could be an amazing relationship. And it usually starts with one person just not being supportive and having no problem putting someone else down, making them feel bad. It's almost like we have a sense of ownership of another person. Where does that come from? Hey, now that we're together and it's clear you're not going to leave me, I can now make you feel bad. In fact, I want to make you feel so bad about yourself that you're completely unhappy being in a relationship with me so that I can be miserable too. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't work. I know I'm a little snarky today, but there is a mentality in some relationships that keeps coming up in the emails that I get. And that is that, oh, I could just treat my partner miserably and they'll never leave me. And unfortunately, sometimes that's true. But why would you make your own life miserable? If I made my girlfriend's life miserable, I guarantee you my life would be miserable. I would be upset. I would definitely probably not have any intimacy. I would definitely lose bonding. I would definitely lose trust. When you do this to your partner, and I have a feeling that a lot of people that listen to this show don't do this to their partner, but many people have partners that do this to them, and then they look for this information online and find this show, and they realize, oh, they're mistreating me. I didn't realize that. Or, oh, finally someone understands that I'm being mistreated and now how do I resolve this? How do I get through this? Yeah, I want to share that information. I want to make sure that I spread the word of my my past mistakes, the stuff that I've done in my relationship, the stuff that I hear about from my clients, where it's just so easy to be hurtful to those that are closest to us. We don't do it to strangers. We don't do it to friends. We don't, well, sometimes do it to family but the person I spend the majority of time with, I have a free pass to treat them badly. It shouldn't be that way. I know I'm on a soapbox today. I can't, <laughs> I can't get off my soapbox, but it should not be that way. I think every person in a relationship should make an effort to build each other up, not tear each other down. I think that's where the hard work is. And it shouldn't even be hard, but it is because we have our own stuff. We have our own emotional triggers, but... That's what we should work on. Let's build each other up. Anyway, thanks for joining me today. Uh, remember to keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve, especially in your relationships. Evolve your relationships. Be the people that build each other up. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something that I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.